many ways, and uh, we, um, we really need one another, but most of all, we need the Lord. And so uh, we're going to sing this anthem today, which will lead into the message, and it's titled, What a Friend. I think you'll recognize it. If I haven't done so already, I want to welcome those who are visiting with us today, and, and again, it's so nice to have you with us, uh, and whether you're old friends or new, we hope that we'll be new friends now. And I want to say a special hello to Gino, who's up in the balcony. Uh, Gino uh, went to school with my daughter Rachel and with Dylan and good friends out there, lived together out in Colorado, and now he's visiting to see how the other half lives out here on the East Coast, and so it's nice to have Gino here. Um, uh, today I want to talk about friendship. I want to talk about friendship with God, and in particular point to David in the relationship he had with the Lord. Uh, my title is God's Friendship is Like a Chain of Gold, and you know, it's interesting, each week I kind of give a title and give the scripture, and then Ellen goes off and she tries to find some appropriate graphic which might uh, am amplify the, the meaning. 
And so she said to me this week, she said, you know, I read the scripture and, and I've been looking for things and I really can't find anything. I don't know what you're trying to get at. And, uh, and then she kind of did some more and she came up with this. And I, I love it. God's friendship is like a chain of gold. It's beautiful. It's precious. And it cannot be broken. You know, over the years, scouting has taught our kids some important lessons. And the special lasting nature of friendship is one of these lessons. There's nothing like a good friend to share life with. I'll never forget one of the first songs that my daughters Rebecca and Sarah learned as Daisy Scouts. And I, I can't sing it for you, but the words go like this. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver, the other is gold. A circle is round, it has no end. That's how long I want to be your friend. I saw Kathy Cable reciting it. Must be an old scout. You know, friendship is like a chain that connects us in a way that blesses both partners. Ask yourself what you would do without good friends. I mentioned Gino because he's been a great friend to Rachel and Dylan for a number of years now. Life would certainly be more challenging if you didn't have friends to share it with. So when we turn to the scriptures, one of the most enduring relationships that we find is that between David. David is a boy, David is a man, a warrior, and a king. And God, his partner, his friend, his father, his sustainer. From the earliest David, days, David learned that he could trust God to be there with him. As a shepherd boy, David was charged with keeping his sheep safe. Everyone in the family probably had a chore or a task to do, and, and it seems that David's was just to keep the flock safe. And as a young boy, he learned to ply his trade as a shepherd boy, and he must have done a good job because he did it for a while, and he often makes reference to it, sometimes in his Psalms, and, and sometimes we hear of it in the scriptural stories. David writes of those days using comparisons with the way that God cares for him. Up on the mountainside watching the sheep late at night with all kinds of foreign animals, ferocious animals out on the, on the, on the landscape. And he writes these words that we love so dearly from the 23rd Psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want he lifts up that model of what shepherding is supposed to be like. That when you have a good shepherd, when you have someone watching over you, you will be safe. You need not fear. You will be led to those green pastures and the, and the flowing waters. And every need will be supplied. And he said, that's how God is. God is doing that for me. As a young boy, he felt that. He experienced that. And he carried that through throughout his life. And if you read through the stories of David, you know he had some challenging times when Everyone seemed to be against him, especially the king. What's amazing about this relationship, that it was, it was unusual for people of that day. You see, God was often seen as distant and removed from human relationships. God was above that. And you probably have known people like that, who they think they're better than you, they're above you, and they don't have anything to do with you because of their status in society. And people often looked at God that way. God was, was this great creator. God was this, this force in nature. God was this, this, this holy other. But not someone you could have a relationship with. He was the lawgiver. He was the one who made the rules. In David's relationship, though, we see something very different Yes, God was the protector, but he was also the companion. And on those long, dark nights, David knew he was not alone, for God was there. That's why when David went up against the Philistine giant, Goliath, he had no fear because he knew that God was with him. When the king questioned him, when the men looked and shivered as they saw him going out with only his slingshot, they thought he was foolish. And he said, why are you afraid? God is with me. I wish I had that kind of courage when facing some of the challenges in my life. Maybe I need to develop even more that relationship I have with God. Maybe you do too, because there are moments in life when we get so afraid, when we're so worried about what the future holds, what's going to happen, and we feel like we're all alone. And yet we have this great, big, wonderful God. That was a song I learned as a child. We have this great, big, wonderful God. We need to trust Him more. 
You know, David told the king and the warriors that with God he needed no one else. The Apostle Paul later was to appropriate his words and he says, if God is on our side, who can stand against us? And I think sometimes in the battles of life, wherever we are, whether it's a health battle or, or maybe it's, it's a relationship that's gone sour, we feel all alone, we feel we have no power, no, no one on our side. We need to remember that we have someone on our side. And he's more powerful than our foe, whatever that might be. And we may still suffer the scars of the battle, but he will carry us through. A little earlier in our text, Samuel had anointed young David as the king. Can you imagine that? There was already a king on the throne. You know trouble was coming. There was King Saul on the throne. And yet, Samuel comes out and says, the Lord told me, he spoke to me, and he said, someone in your family is going to be the king. And they paraded all the boys there, the strong ones who were going off to war, all the way down. And, and Samuel says, no, no, none of these. <laughs> you have any other boys? And they said, well, we got David. Bring him out. And God said, this is the one. And I think it was because of the relationship that David had from an early age that blossomed and grew in him, even still as a young boy, where God said, this is going to be my man. He is a man after my own heart. He cares. He's got compassion. He's got bravery. He's got all these things. Plus, he has reached out and called me friend. You know, he hadn't done anything extraordinary up to that point. But he was simply walking with God every day. And I think that's the key. We can all be friends with God if we invite him into our daily routine and say, God, walk with me. Help me make it through the day. I want to say something here. You never know where God will lead you once you begin walking with him. I'm sure that many of you could give testimonies on what God has done for you. The places you've been, the people you've met. And I'm not talking about celebrities. You know, we've all maybe met one famous person in our life and maybe it was just by accident. We were in the right place at the right time. But, but I'm talking about these amazing people that have touched and influenced our Christian walk. The people who show up and maybe they're just there for a time. But you know they were placed by God there. I'll give you an example. Back in 1995, I was going through a rough spot. Uh, Lori and I had looked at the possibility of leaving the church in Norwich. We had another opportunity. It was a great opportunity. And, and, um, and in the end, for a number of reasons that I won't go into, we decided not to take that opportunity to stay in Norwich. And I was feeling badly about the situation, wondering if I had made the right decision and, and uh, knowing that I, I felt called to stay there in Norwich. But, but it was then that I met a, a friend and he said, why don't you come to our, our prayer breakfast? Now, my experience of prayer breakfast was this. You go out, you meet at a local restaurant, and you say a prayer, and then you talk about the Red Sox and Yankees or Tigers or whatever. And, and, and so when they invited me to a prayer breakfast, I, I was thinking, okay, that's great. I love those kind of gatherings. We'll say a little prayer, obligatory prayer, and, and we'll just get to know each other. And, and I showed up. It was going to be at this one pastor's house, and, uh, and it was 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm an early person, so it was no big deal, but I was hungry, and, and we got there, and I was looking for the breakfast, but there was no breakfast. It was an hour of prayer. Now, I know some of us have a hard time praying for five minutes, or two minutes, or one minute, but it was an hour of prayer, and there was about a dozen people there, and, and for an hour, we, we just prayed about, we prayed about individual situations, we prayed about the churches we were serving, we prayed about the community we were living in, we prayed about the world and the things that were happening. And, and for an hour we prayed. And then they said, you're going to come back next week? And I said, yeah. Yeah, this is something I never experienced before. A closeness to God that I had never felt. And I didn't realize it, but I kind of knew. They, these were Pentecostal pastors. <laughs> and they really believed that God made a difference. Now, I, I say that and it sounds sarcastic. But sometimes I wonder if in our praying and even with our relationship with God, we don't believe God can't do any of the things the Bible says He can do. But these pastors believed it. And week after week, I began to understand the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer. And I began to really understand what it was to trust God, to walk with God. 
because in those days that followed, some amazing things happened in the church. The church caught fire. We began to grow. New things were starting. I remember though, and it's appropriate that the memory would come back today, but I remember my daughter, Rebecca, was probably, oh, let's see, she was about 10 at the time, and she had fallen and broken her wrist. And um, I, I mentioned that at the prayer meeting, and uh, one of the pastors said, well, did you pray with her? I said, what? He <laughs> said, well, you're the pastor. I said, well, she's my daughter. I hadn't really thought, put two and two together, the two roles as, as father and pastor and daughter. And I said, well, no, I didn't. And so they prayed for her, and, and then they said, now you go home and pray for your daughter. And you know, sometimes I think that even for some of us, and it doesn't matter if you're a pastor, we don't necessarily pray for ourselves or ask people to pray for, our, for what's going on in our lives unless, unless we're so devastated that we have nowhere else to turn. Then we say, can you pray for me? But they taught me the power of prayer. And so that's why, like today, I ask you to pray for my family, my, my dad. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm doing okay because that was my prayer. These last months have been very difficult and he had no quality of life. And yet, I know that in the hours ahead, it's going to hit me because he was so good. But the truth is, that God wants to be there in those moments. He wants to have that kind of a relationship, a deep abiding friendship with you, that, that when you're in trouble or when you are, are uh, looking for some consolation, He wants to be there. The problem is, is a lot of times we shut Him out. And again, I, I think I've used this illustration before. I, I remember, you know, Archie Bunker was a nominal Christian. As some of you remember, all in the family. And, and he was going through this real difficult time. I don't remember the circumstances. But his son-in-law, Michael, who was an atheist, says to him, says, why don't you pray to this God you're talking about all the time? And ask him for help. And Archie says, ah, he's too busy creating earthquakes and tornadoes and all that kind of thing to worry about my little problem. I call that the Archie Bunker Theology. Sometimes we think of God like they did in David's time as, as out there and bigger and, and far away and, and not concerned with what's happening in our lives. And yet God wants to be a friend. The writer of that hymn, there's an amazing story of uh, Joseph Scriven who wrote, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. The losses he suffered. But the comfort he found in his life was his relationship with God that was more of a friendship than a worship. And again, when you have a friendship, you can have a worship. And we worship God, and I don't want to take anything away from that. He is, he is the object of our worship. And yet, He also wants to have that personal relationship with each and every one of us. The Bible tells us about that friendship that David had with King Saul's son, Jonathan. They became like brothers. If you read through 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, they fought side by side. And the relationship, when it, when it went sour with David and King Saul, Jonathan was there to run interference. Their relationship was likened to the one that David had with God. They were buddies. They give their lives for one another. When you read through the Psalms, David pours out his heart to God. There's intimacy there. Trust and obedience are on display. This morning we read part of Psalm 25 as our responsive reading. And this particular Psalm reveals the depths of God and David's relationship. David sees God as being trustworthy in verses 1 through 3. He reflects on the fact that God gives good advice in verses 4 and 5. He feels loved in verse 6. He finds forgiveness in verse 7. And in verses 8 to 10, he declares that God helps in good decision making. But best of all, David declares in verses 15 to 22 that God will always be there when you're in trouble. And you see, that's what a friend does. God is better than any human, human friend we could ever have. He's like gold. He's precious. He'll never stop loving us and He's there with us all the time. Sometimes our friends aren't there when we need them. But God is always there for us. He may sit silently in the background just being with us. I love our Jewish friends when someone dies. They have this process called sitting shiva where for seven days after the death of a loved one, people will visit the house, not necessarily to try to console them, but just to be with them. 
And that's what God does. He sits Shiva with us in those difficult times. So it's only natural as we read this story today that David wants to do something for God. He wants to bless God in some way like God has blessed him his whole life through. He's had so many victories, including capturing the mountain city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was set way up on a hill. It was, it was considered invincible. If you could have that as your capital, as that as your, your stronghold, no one could ever get you. And David captured it. And now he made it the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. And he built a fortress and a palace there. And he said, now what can I do for God? Here, I've taken care of myself. I've got this beautiful place. We've got this great fortress. I want to build a temple for God. He's wandering around in the Ark of the Covenant under a tent. He should have a place fit for the King of Kings. And God says to Nathan the prophet, tell him, no, no, I, I don't need that. And you know, it, it, it makes sense. To want to have a place for God. Sometimes we look at the sanctuary of the church as a place of God. We come here and we've had weddings and baptisms and funerals and celebrations in the church. And so sometimes we come to look at this as the place where God lives. And I've said this before. We go out the front door, out the back. We say, okay, we'll see you later. We'll be back. But God said to David, I don't want a place. You've you, you got to understand that my place is out there. It's with you. I don't need a physical place because I belong with my people. And so he said to David, no, you're not going to build me a temple. No, you're not going to build a temple. I think sometimes we want to build a place for God so that we can have it all wrapped up. You know, we want to put God in a box so that we can, we can, we can then, when we need Him, we can pull Him out. Say, okay, someone referred to, to the fact that sometimes we like to have God like a genie in a bottle, that we kind of put him there on the shelf and we go through life and then all of a sudden something happens and we grab, we grab God and, and we rub the, the bottle. Okay, God, I need you now. But, but God doesn't want that kind of relationship with us. He wants to walk with us every day, wherever we go. He wants to be a friend. Jesus would later describe the way God works to Nicodemus, who was one of those who wanted to put God in a box. He knew all the laws and what was supposed to be, and he, he knew how to dot all the I's and cross the T's. And he'd say, God is like the wind. You never know where it blows. He's here. He's there. He's everywhere. So to build a temple was to declare that God was only in one place, and David should have known better because he had walked with God across the nations onto the battlefields and the hills around them. And anyone who walks with God knows you can't keep them in one place. Yet the truth is, the truth is that there's something more. And that passage points to it. God says to David, I don't need anything from you, but I want to give you something. I want to establish your kingdom now and forever. And the truth is, as we read through the Old Testament, we see that there were 20 generations of kings of David's descendants on the throne of Judah. 20 generations. Can you imagine that? 20 generations. It lasted for 500 years. The throne of David was established there. You know, if we had a king in our country and the king's relatives went down, we just saw Prince Charles become King Charles, our nation would only be halfway there to what the kingdom of David experienced. But he said, I want to establish your kingdom, and your kingdom will reign. Your name will be lifted up on high. You will be recognized, and you will be remembered. But even more so, I want to give you a second gift. That second gift is that one of your descendants will be a gift to all humankind. He will be the Savior of the world. And that's what you'll be remembered for because you are my friend. Now, he didn't use those words. Don't go looking in the Scripture for it. But because you are my friend, because you're a man after my own heart, because I want to bless you in the relationship we had, one of your own chosen seed will be the Savior of the world. You know, that's what we celebrate when we come to the communion table. We celebrate this relationship that we have with God this God that loved us so much that He gave us this Son who became the sal salvation for all who would believe. And, and so we come to the table today. You know, our stewardship theme is from bread and cup to generosity. It is because of the friendship we have with God, the blessing of His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for us, 
Jesus said, who, who would give their life for another? You know, only someone who would love that person. Jesus gave his life for us because he considered us friend. Not just servant, not just somebody, but friend. You and I are friends of God too. And the gold that comes in our relationship comes through the table, the bread and the cup. And today we come to that and we come to celebrate that love. You know, Lori and I have been watching a variation of Antiques Road Shows. And it's kind of like a detective series. I, I'd never seen it, but it's new. And, uh, or maybe it's not new. We, ju we just got rid of cable. So now we're watching all these uh, streaming programs. So this is the latest one. And, and if you've seen it, the show has people bringing uh, some family heirloom to an expert who then tells them a little bit about the history of the item and its ultimate value. It's a gift that's passed down through the generations, and that's what we have from David here. We have a gift, the gift of eternal life, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of salvation. Our text today does that for the Lord's Supper that we celebrate. It reminds us of how precious it is, and it came through the love of God for his people. David shows us what it is to walk with God, to form that bond, and to know its blessing. And today, as we come to the table, you and I can celebrate that same bond. It is precious. And so I invite you now to open your hearts. It says that when we come to the table, we should examine ourselves. And if there's any, anything in our lives that should separate us from God, that we should confess it to Him. And you don't have to confess it to a priest, a minister, or anyone else. Just say, God, God, you know, I struggle with this. And I need your help. Good friend, Jesus, take away this bent on sinning and give me the water of living life. As I come to the table today, help me be a new creation. Recreate in me a new heart so that we can be friends and walk through our days together. May that be your prayer as we come to the table. Amen. We're going to sing our hymn, Come Share the Lord. It's number 782.